Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time zone you may be in. And welcome to my Open Source Summit Japan presentation on some new kernel email tools. I'm Frank Rowland, currently working for Sony, have been for many, many years, and I've been presenting at Open Source Summit Japan ever since it had several other names. And glad to be back again this year and looking forward to seeing you all in person next year. Uh, feel free to be asking questions as we go through the presentation. This is being pre-recorded, so I will be attending live, uh, watching in the, probably in the chat room, depending on the platform. It'll either be uh, chats or a Q&A tab. Uh, feel free to use either one to ask me questions as we go through the presentation. And I'll try to leave room at the end of the presentation for more questions. We'll see how fast I get through the slides. I have quite a few to cover today, but I'll try and make good progress through them. So what was the reason I, I chose to give this talk? Why do we care about this issue? Um, when we make changes to the Linux kernel, the way that we do that is by sending in patch emails. And over the years, people have asked, is this process efficient? Is it easy to use? And my somewhat sarcastic response is, uh, there have been some complaints about ease of use over the years. It actually has been a very efficient process and has scaled fairly well. So I'm going to give an overview of what the, the patch email flow looks like in the next slide. And it is a simplified conceptual view. Uh, don't take it as being precise reality. But it shows how a patch is created, how it's submitted, and then how it is applied. So we start in the upper left-hand corner, and you start working with your base files unmodified. And over time, you, you make changes to the files, and now you have a set of modified files. Uh, somehow you create a diff of what the files used to look like and what they look like after you made your changes. And the result of that is stored into patch files. You use an email client to send your patch files, and they flow from your email client through an email server and we're going to take the diagonal down to the right path into the internet. And we'll be coming out into someone else's email server and their email client's going to read your emails. And you need to, that person will be using their client to extract the patch files. And then they will start with the same exact unmodified files that you started with. They will use some way of applying the patch files to end up with the same modified files uh, that you ended up with after making your changes. Uh, you'll note that there's an alternate path through the internet coming from the email server. Your email is potentially also going to a list server who will archive your, your emails. And that archive can be accessed via web server. And the client for that would be the web browser. And you can use the web browser to, to then save the patch files locally. And again, use that same uh, process to apply patches. And this is what the process looked like about two years ago. So what could possibly go wrong in such a simple process? And I'm quoting me as saying it's a simple process. I've been corrected after several years of trying to claim that. And the reality is it actually is a fairly complex process, as simple as it looks. There's plenty of room for human errors. It's difficult to use. And usability is not what we would call good. So this is a, a, a concept I like to use. Uh, what goes in may not look like uh, what goes out. So you put data into the, in the process, and at various points in the process, it may look like your data went through a blender. And what goes into a blender is the same stuff that comes out, but it may not look the same. So those various transformations throughout that entire uh, flow on the previous chart may or, not be un may or may not be under your control. You may be able to choose what email client you use. You may or may not be able to choose what email server you use. So here's our, our picture we saw before. Let's get lined up. Um, and let's modify that. Let's see where those various points where data can be manipulated with that blender quite a few different places. Email clients and servers, list servers, web servers serving content of an archive, email servers receiving email, email clients receiving email, 
uh, web browsers retrieving uh, patches from a, a, a web archive. Lots of potential places to be corrupting your, your patch emails. So we, we accept that those data transformations can occur. So historically what we've done is we've tried to fix up those problems. And that manual fix up and turns out to be extra work. And you'll find that each maintainer has their own scripts and processes to solve the issues from those transformations. So as of 2019, we had some Git tools that helped somewhat in solving some of those problems. Um, Git provided several commands on the creation and sending end of, of that flow. Git format patch to create patches, Git send email to replace the email client, and Git AM to apply the received patches. So looking at our picture again, we can see where those Git tools came into play. On the creation side, we see Git format patch, creating patch files, Git send email, replacing the email client. And once patch files have been received, we see Git AM applying those patch files. As of June 2018, a new tool came on the scene the Laura Mail e uh, archive, and Constantine is announcing in this email that uh, it's been through a bit of development and it's pretty solid now. It's official, you can start using that tool, and it's a well-supported, maintained tool. So here's where we left our diagram. We had a, another change to it with Git Lore. And now we have Lore supplying our list server archive. Uh, before having Lore, we were depending upon third-party archives that may come or go at any given point, and we could not count on those. And when Lore was created, uh, the data from those third-party archives was gathered together. So we have quite an extensive archive now of the, the history before Lore existed even. And moving forward, Laura is capturing the, the emails as they are uh, created and sent. So as of January 2020, this year, a new tool arrived, Get Laura Mbox. And again, this is Constantin's announcement of it. And at the, at the end of January, beginning of this year, he's saying that he wrote a quick helper script. And it uses the message ID from an email to grab the entire thread containing that email. It grabs the thread from the lore kernel org archive. And he saves the, the result as an mbox file. And the cool thing about that is that mbox can then be sent into the git am command and used to apply those patches. So this is um, an early, early effort. This is not really expected to be uh, production quality yet. And so he, Constantine was saying, please try it out. Uh, let me know how it works. Uh, let me know what I can do to fix it. He's saying it's still a bit raw around the edges. So it's, it is, it's more than a proof of concept. It actually is working, but he's still finding corner cases. And so he, he wants to hear back from us, learning where there are issues and how we can fix it and improve it, add functionality even. So he was setting expectations. Um, this tool is, is doing a, a rather difficult task. It's analyzing human formatted emails and human formatted email subjects. Uh, the emails are appearing in, a, in an indeterminate order and some emails may be replying to other emails. Uh, the timing of when emails arrive is, it can be somewhat random. And those emails are being touched by lots of various email clients and servers who can be making the various transma transformations that were causing us problems before. So the expectation should be that Git Lore and Box should be having some hiccups. It should have some issues, some problems. It should have some failures with certain email threads. 
Um, but it's very important to note that the tool author, Constantin, is very responsive to anybody reporting issues, anybody reporting bugs, and anybody suggesting how to improve the tool. He has a, a good history of uh, very, very quickly responding. And long comes March, so two and a half months, or one and a half months later, uh, he decided to make some changes. And in the course of making those changes, um, part of that was um, using uh, a new name for the tool to make a, a clear delineation. So the tool became B4 instead of get lower mbox. So just if you read about get lower mbox, just do a transformation in your mind that that really is now the, the B4 tool. And it's now a Python project, not just a script. So it's, it's moved into a, a, a better form. So here we have our diagram as we last saw it when we had added lore. And the next thing is uh, before has been added. So this last portion of the flow is covered by this new tool. So instead of receiving emails through an email server, through an email client, we can now use the B4 tool to access the email archives through a web browser, conceptually through a web browser. And optionally in this left box, we can use B4 to directly apply through a pipeline into Git AM to apply the patches that B4 has retrieved. So B4 is now covering the end of the chain here, receiving the, the patch emails, and potentially applying those patch emails. And that little corner of the diagram might appear to be a, a fairly small factor, but that small addition has an immense impact on improving the workflow that we, that we face as developers and maintainers. So don't underestimate how powerful and how useful and how transformative this, this new tool B4 is. And it turns out that there's even more that B4 can do, do beyond that, but I'm not gonna be talking about those extra features today. I'll, I'll mention that they exist. So to introduce B4, the current version is 0 0.5.2 as of November 2020. It's important to note that B4 requires Python 3, currently version greater than or equal to 3.6. Originally, I was using Python 2 and, and Git lower mbox, the predecessor to B4, and quickly found out that that was problematic. So I, I can attest personally that you do not want to use an old version of Python, it's just not even worth trying to deal with the, the incompatibilities and the fact that it just, B4 will just work very poorly for you and most often or quite frequently fail. So use Python 3 and you'll be in good shape. B4 has an extensive help system. And at the top level, it's just listing out the various subcommands, which is somewhat similar to the way that Git works. So you'd say B4 and then some subcommand. So like before mbox, for example. And I'm going to talk specifically about mbox, am. Um, I, I didn't bold PR. I'll, I'll try to fit that in. We may run out of time. And diff I'm going to punt on, although I will mention it. Uh, so there are these other commands. Attest, att verify, PRs I mentioned I'm going to try to get to in TY, these are more of interest for maintainers than for submitters. And in this presentation, I'm looking more at how submitters use before, not so much how maintainers are. So start with the, uh, the first two commands, the mbox and am. They're very similar, but, but distinct in, their, in what they do. Before mbox will fetch a patch series email thread and put it into an mbox file. The important thing about the mbox command is that email thread includes all of the reply emails. So it includes the original patch series, 
emails submitted into the into the um, <laughs> the mail list and all the the review replies, all the comment replies. On the other hand, there's a typo here. This should not be B E A M. That should be B four A M. Um, fetches fetches that same patch series into an inbox file, but only the patches patch series. It does not include any replies. Does not include any common emails. And then separately, the cover letter, which is patch zero of the series, is fetched into a dot cover file. So bit B4AM creates two files, an inbox file and a cover file. B4AM box simply creates an inbox file. And we'll see some examples of how that works. So starting with B4AM box, again, we're going to fetch an entire patch series email thread into an inbox file, including all of the reply emails. This is the top portion of the help for the inbox command. So for any subcommand, you type the command, so it'd be for inbox, followed by the dash dash help, instead of putting the help before the, the subcommand. And one thing to note here is that in your usage, one thing that you can supply is a message ID. And that's gonna be critical to understanding how to use B4 in all of its uh, forms. Uh, the full help um, will, be sent, will be in a slide in the supporting materials after the end of the talk. So if you don't have access to B4 directly, you can look in the, the end slides to see the, the full set of options for the inbox command. So here's an example of using before inbox. Uh, we have, I, I'm doing a little bit of extra um, commands just to make it easier to show my work. So I'm creating a temporary directory, changing directory into that. So that we'll have an empty directory and we'll see any artifacts that'll it'll be easy to see what gets created by the command. I run the command before inbox with some magical message ID and it tells us what it's doing. And it tells us that it saved the result into this .mbx file. If I do an ls, I see that file is the only thing in my current directory. And you'll note that the name of that inbox file is the message ID, the same thing we set, gave it as input, with .mbx added onto the end. So where do you get an M, in, a message ID from? How do you know what that magic extensive value is? So I'm going to show an example of a, an email thread, and we'll approach, approach the same email thread several times over. So we'll keep using the same message ID. And I'm going to show a screenshot of the patch thread in my Thunderbird email client. Thunderbird is what I use in my daily work uh, for receiving and sending emails. And the, in the screenshot, the entire patch series thread, including replies, will be inside of a red box. And there's going to be a random email, which is inside a blue box. So we'll be, here's what it's gonna look like. And here's my Thunderbird email client. So everything here in the red box is the entire email thread. So we have the original patch emails. Here we have one reply. And I've decided that I'm just gonna pick randomly the fourth patch file email. And I'm gonna get the message ID from that email. So I can use any email at all in this entire thread. I'm just randomly choosing one that's convenient for me to, uh, to access. So if I look at the email headers of that specific email, you notice that the subject line matches what we just saw in Thunderbird, patch 404. The message, message ID header has this long cryptic value. And that long cryptic value is the message ID. And that's what I used in the B4 command in the previous slide. I'll, I'll just keep reusing the same message ID 
and a bunch of following commands and slides. So there are multiple ways of getting the message ID. I'm not going to tell you for every single different email client how to do it, um, but since I use Thunderbird, I know a few ways there. And typically I use the view headers all path. Um, another way, actually, I'm sorry, that's, that's one path to use. I, I don't like to look at all the headers. I normally use view message source, and I'm increasingly just using control U. Control U is the same exact thing as view message source. Um, so those second and third options will open a new window showing the entire email, uh, including all of the, the message headers. And then it's easy to cut and paste the message ID out of that. Um, I've been told that there's also a, a copy message ID add-on for Thunderbird that can be used to uh, display the message ID in your normal display. Or I'm sorry, to, to essentially do a cut. There was another add-on previously that apparently no longer exists that could be used to display the message ID in your normal uh, message list display. So those sorts of add-ons may come and go over time. Uh, MUT's another common email client. And if you want to have MUT display or to show your message ID header line with all the other email headers that it normally shows, modify your .mutrc and simply add unignore message ID. And then for all of your MUT emails, you'll see the message ID header along with all the other email headers. Okay, so we saw before um, using B4 MBOX to fetch a patch series email thread. We, we gave it the command with the, the message ID and it created an MBOX file. And once you have that MBOX file, you can use any normal email client or text tools to examine the mailbox file. So um, you can use that to look at your cover letter email, the patch emails, and the reply emails. They're all in this mailbox inbox file. Uh, typical clients would be things like MUT, Elm, uh, text tools, which are a lot more painful, would be things like Head, Cat, or Less VI. Let's we'll see some examples. Here I'm using MUT to examine the inbox file. And you'll see the same exact emails that you saw in my original uh, screenshot of my Thunderbird email client. So we see patch zero, the cover letter. We see the patch emails, one, two, three, and four. We see a reply email. So B4 has fetched all of these emails from the uh, lower archive and saved them off into an inbox file, which I can then examine with my email client. Okay, in contrast to MBOX, the AM command is only fetching the emails that contain the patches and also the cover letter. So the, the patch series is all combined into a single MBOX file and the cover letter is saved off into a separate .cover file. And the format of the cover file is something in an MBOX file, but it's missing one header line. Uh, and again, there are no reply emails on the MBOX file, simply the original patches. And the usefulness of this is you can use it as input to get AM. That's typically what you'll use it for. Or if you personally just want to examine the patches and don't care about everyone else's commenting about them. So here's the parts of the B4AM help command that we're interested in today. Uh, again, the message ID is important. One thing I'll be talking about is using the dash O outdoor option. And for the outdoor option, if you use dash as the name of outdoor, then that sends your output to standard out. And that will, we'll find that to be a useful feature. Uh, there's a lot more again in, in the help and the full help is in the supplemental slides after the final slide of the presentation. So here we are, an example of fetching that same exact patch series 
using the same message ID we've been using before, using the git am command this time instead of git instead of b4m box. And you'll see that b4 simply writes the four patches into the mbox file. And then separately into the cover file, it writes the, the cover letter, patch zero. So if I do an ls after this command, I'll see two files resulting, the .cover file and the .mbx file, the mailbox. And instead of using the message ID as the name of the files, in this case, it's used the um, subject line of patch zero to create that, that file name. So it may look kind of <laughs> long and obscure, but, but it really does make sense where that, that file name came from, and you can predict what that's gonna be. So again, the result of the B4AM is just the patch emails, no reply emails. Just to make that difference really explicit. And that's, again, an inbox file, but the cover letter is in a, a text file. It's not inbox format. So now we can look at those two files. Again, our, our inbox file we can use an email client to look at. Um, our cover file, we have to use normal text tools to look at. So looking at the cover letter, again, if I try to use, it's not an inbox file, so if I try to use a mail client like MUT to examine that cover file, MUT will tell me it's not a mailbox. So instead I simply used head here and you can quickly see why I don't want to use text tools to look at uh, the cover letter, because we end up with all of these header files, I'm sorry, all of these email header lines in the message, and I'm typically not really interested in those. That's just noise to me. So one trick to actually convert that cover file into a standard inbox file is simply add one single header line that's missing. And a trick here that I've been using is to simply copy the first line of the inbox file and use that as my first line of my cover file. Uh, so here is simply doing a head dash n1. I'm taking the first line of my mailbox file. And you can see it says from mailer daemon and gives a date. So using my fun bash skills, if I use the cat command to combine that one header line with the rest of my cover letter. I cat that head command, which is simply getting me my one header <laughs> header line. Um, this looks like a typo. Uh, this this greater than sign on the second line should not exist. Um, so the the, <laughs> uh, the first argument to cat is is extracting that that first header line the yeah the first email header with the head command. The second argument to cat is the cover letter file, and then we're combining those together and outputting them into a new cover and box file. And now Mutt can actually examine. That, that cover and box file is a standard and box file. So looking at just the patches in the inbox file that before created using MUT, here we see only the patches. And notice again, we're not seeing patch zero because patch zero is the cover letter. We see patches one, two, three, and four. So this is a repeat slide, we saw this before. This was the example of B4 um, being used to create an inbox file and the cover file. And 
when we, we run that command, you'll see what's bolded here. I'm going to show on the next slide is in color. It has this git am text. So here is that that copied from the previous slide. So the b4am command tells us what git am command specifically to use to apply that mailbox file to our current uh, git tree. So we can simply cut and paste that git am command. So b4 is making our life easier. It's trying to help us out. So here's an example of using that. Um, I create a new branch to work on. And there are a couple of lines here I'm using just to make this example easier to show the result. So I'm, I'm modifying a random file, doing a git add and doing a git commit. So now I have a place I can tag as my starting point before doing the git am command. So before making any changes, I have a, a tag sysfs id v2 before. Then I'm applying, I'm using that git am command that the b4am uh, output told me to use. And we see that git am is applying four separate patches, creating four commits. And if I do a git log from the starting point through top, we'll see those four patches show up as four commits, as we would expect. So we can avoid a little bit of that complexity and instead of creating an inbox file and then applying it with a git am command, we can directly apply uh, the, the changes in a single command. So again, I'm, I'm doing a little bit of extra work just so I can show the results, uh, creating a new branch to do the work on. Again, I'm uh, editing an arbitrary file, doing an add and commit so I can create a tag. So now we have a tag of before making any changes at all on our new branch. And then I'm going to apply that, that patch series in a single step, a single command. So uh, using the b4am command, I'm adding one extra feature in here, the dash q quiet. So we get a little bit less noise in our slide. And here I'm using the dash o option for the first time. Again, dash o space dash says send the output of the b4am command to standard out instead of creating an inbox file. It also means we will not get a cover letter file. So go fetch the, the patch series matching this message ID, send it to standard out, and then we'll pipe it directly into git am. And we'll see again the messages from git am applying each of those separate emails as a separate commit. So we see our four apply lines. So just to make it more obvious what we did different on that previous slide, it's uh, the, the new stuff was we did a b4-qam-0- So we're simply saying send the output to standard out instead of into a file and then pipe it into git am. So this is really all that you need to know. The, the previous slide was a lot of extra extraneous stuff. And after having a, done that single step, this is the result we can exam with. Again, git log, and once again, as expected, we see separate, four separate commits, one commit for each of the patches in the patch series. So no surprises there. There are some people from the old days, myself included, who like to use the quilt tool in addition to or instead of, of Git. And it can be quite useful when you're, you're managing a bunch of um, different series of patches at, at the same time. Um, it, at a very high level, conceptually, Quilt is based on the concept of each change is an individual patch file, just like we've been seeing uh, individual emails containing patches 
Um, so you can think of those emails as being a quilt patch file. And then quilt also has a series file which lists the actual patch files in the order they get applied. So I'm not going to go into to detail to explain how to use Quilt. Um, so if you don't know you don't know Quilt, um, most of this won't really make much sense to you. But if you know Quilt, this should be pretty straightforward. So um, to create Quilt compatible files with your B4AM command, you simply specify the dash Q or dash dash Quilt ready option, and before will fetch the patch series just like it was before and create individual patch files and create a series file listing the patch files instead of cre create well in addition to creating the inbox file uh, before will still create the inbox file in addition to this and you can use the individual patch files on the series file as input for quilt push or as is the data used by quilt push essentially so here's an example of using the the quote compatibility. In this case, I'm using the dash Q option. And you can see that P4 is telling us that it's creating a cover file. It's creating patches. And if we do an LS, we see the cover file just like before. We see the inbox file just like before, and then we see a patches directory. This is actually a directory, not a file. And then if we go into that directory, do an ls, we'll see four individual files that are patches. Each one of those corresponds to one of the patch emails, and then we'll see a series file. And if we look at the contents of the series file, we'll see that it lists each of the patches that needs to be applied in the specific order that they'll be applied. Again, matching the actual original patch emails. So explaining how to combine those uh, artifacts into an existing quilt project is a little bit beyond the scope of this presentation, but if you if you know how to use quilt, it's pretty straightforward and it should be pretty obvious how to how to take those and and add them into your quilt project. The next command I'm going to talk about is the PR subcommand. And the reason this can be useful as a, a submitter is asking questions of did my maintainer's pull request get into mainline? So when I send patches to my uh, maintainer, he'll pull them into his tree, and then he'll send Linus a, a pull request, which incorporates my my patches. And the second question that Fior, bit sorry before PR can answer is, uh, what actually is inside any specific maintainer's pull request? So here's the PR command help options. As usual, we expect the message ID to be a, an important argument to the command. Uh, this message ID is going to be a little bit different than what we've been thinking about conceptually, uh, or in some ways the same. The message ID in this case is coming from the maintainer's pull request. The maintainer will send a single email to Linus telling Linus exactly what tree to pull from. And so when you submit patches to your maintainer, your maintainer will accept your patches, uh, add them as commits into his tree. The, the message ID in the pull request is totally unrelated to the message ID in your original patch series. So that, that's the difference in, in how to think about message ID. There's, there's no direct way to go back to your original patch series from the, the message ID and the maintainer's pull request, you actually have to go a little bit deeper and, and start unpeeling things. So here's an example of running before PR, simply checking 
was a maintainer's pull request accepted and did it get into Linus's tree? And this message ID says at bogus that it really is a true message ID. It is valid. And B4 looks it up, finds the thread, looks at the pull request, and checks to see whether it's in the git tree in the directory that I'm currently located in. And B4 finds that the pull request actually was accepted. It actually does exist inside my master branch. So the pull request was um, was processed by Linus and it did arrive up in mainline. There's another command B4 diff and what B4 diff uh, implements is a range diff, a git range diff. And I don't really have time to discuss that. So I'm going to instead suggest that you go look at Constantine's animated example. And this is a really good example. It's just a few minutes long. So go to this URL and just take a look at it and see how it works. And I also provide a little bit more information about this command in the resource end slides. So you can, when you download my slides, you can look there. Okay, how can you structure your patch emails to be B4 friendly? Uh, the most important thing is follow the patch email subject rules. They're, they're a little bit uh, loose and arbitrary, but they are fairly standardized also. So make sure that you're using the proper versioning syntax, V2, V3, et cetera. Uh, make sure that you're using the proper um, sequencing number for each patch within an email series. So the cover letter is 0 of 3, the first patch is 1 of 3, the second patch is 2 of 3, third is 3 of 3. If you do new versions, make sure that you have the appropriate series uh, numbers for the number of patches you have. Um, for a given patch series, make sure that you start with patch zero as being a top level email and each of the individual patches is a reply, is a reply to uh, patch email zero. It's useful to not start a new version of the patch series as a reply to a, a previous version. Try and start each new version of the patch series is an entirely new thread, not replying to a previous version. How can you make B4 better? Uh, you don't actually have to submit patches to make it better. This is a whole lot easier. Uh, simply report your issues to the tools mail list and you can see the archive of the tools mail list at the, the URL I list there. As I mentioned before, uh, Constantin is, has been very, very responsive. Uh, typically, he responds the same day when you report an issue and has a solution. Uh, I guess I'm putting some pressure on him to never take a vacation. So, uh, yeah, you, you can still take vacations. Don't, don't worry, Constantin, we'll, we'll be understanding. Um, and again, he's been very, very active in this last year. He's added a lot of features. And as soon as a problem appears, he's been there to fix it and make the tool work better. So what I've talked about before is uh, giving an introduction to B4 and why it's your friend. Uh, the problems it tries to deal with are email transformations. Uh, there's some places that it, it cannot handle. It just, it's not within that part of the, uh, the process path. So it does not fix issues in the email send path. So the client, uh, email client and the email server that the client's talking to any issues there uh, before uh, cannot handle. Um, I, I sort of hesitate when I'm saying that. Um, some of those transformations um, are solved, but I, I think they're handled more by Git than by before. Um, 
B4 does avoid the receive path. So B4 avoids all of the problems that, that get created in the receive path of uh, receiving client um, emails, I'm sorry, receiving email server and receiving email client. B4 makes it a lot easier to fetch the patch email threads and to save them into a useful file. It's much easier to fetch just the patch series with no replies, no comments. It's much easier to apply that patch series into your repository. And again, there are other more advanced features that B4 provides for us. And I suggest using the help command to explore the, the various options that, that, that are provided, because I've, I've ignored essentially all the options. That's the end of the talk. And again, I should be in the chat and or question tabs of the presentation tool. Uh, thank you for attending today and ask questions. And as I noted before, um, there are resources here. Let me uh, come back first to tell you how to get a copy of the slides. Uh, you can send me an email. A second way is if you go to the Linux Foundation events page, there should be a link to the, the various uh, conferences. And if this is 2023 when you're seeing this, you should be able to look back to the 2020 uh, event and find all the slides from that. And if you're in the, the current day of 2020, uh, sked.org, if you look on the schedule, click on the actual presentation and the slides will have a link from there. And I, I did note a couple of typos when I was talking today, so I'll, I'll attempt to fix those typos before I upload the slides. Uh, but you should be able to access those slides before the conference begins. Since we have a, a couple minutes left, uh, while you're asking me questions, I'll point out some of the resources at the end of the slide deck, just so you're aware of them. Uh, the lower mail list archives, where they're located. Uh, the, the mail list that you care about has to be in the archive for B4 to work. So you have to, you can check which, which mail lists are actually archived. If any mail list you care about is not archived, you can request that that gets added to lore. And then the, the finally URL is just some more interesting information about lore. Uh, if you <laughs> use B4, you need to get it. Uh, so there are two ways to get B4. Uh, one is to download the Git repo that contains it, and this is the instructions on that. The other way, if you're a Python person, you're probably familiar with the pip method of installing, and this is information on that. If you have bug reports and issues, this is where you send those, re those to, as I mentioned before. And then these are all the, the help pages for B4. And then a little bit more information about B4diff from one of the emails Constantin sent. So it's a pleasure uh, talking with you all today and look forward to seeing you in future years in, in Tokyo.